Thank you, Jim. I add my uh, greetings to that of the Dean, James Hudnut Bromler, and welcome you to the opening session of this conference, the Black Church's 11th hour, the promise of our ideals and the realities of our time. On behalf of the conference co-sponsors, Vanderbilt Divinity School professors Victor Anderson, who is director of African American Studies, Vanderbilt University, Dale P. Andrews, and from Women Preach Incorporated, Valerie Bridgman, professor at Lancaster Theological Seminary. And on behalf of the Keller Moore Smith Institute Research and Teaching Faculty, Professors Herbert Marbury, Juan Floyd Thomas, Stacy Floyd Thomas, and the administrative genius who is really behind this conference, Shatika Brown. Yes. <laughs> we are delighted to have all of you participate in this conference, which is designed to be an engaging dialogue about the prophetic tradition of black Christianity, black liberation theology, and the continuing social crisis of faith, race, and culture facing the black church. In the past, social justice praxis and ministry formation has been the rubric under which the Keller Mill Smith Institute on the Black Church Studies offered conferences, theological seminars, and intensive programs for now more than two decades. In keeping with this mission, but broadening its scope to include womanist ethics and theological research on race and culture, we celebrate at this conference our newly appointed vision for what we have named the Kelly Miller Smith Center for Black Faith and Public Life at Vanderbilt University and the Divinity School. In light of the announcement of this new center, I am very pleased and delighted to have one of the world's most preeminent theologians of the black theological movement in the United States, Dr. James H. Cone, the Charles A. Briggs Distinguished Professor of Systematic Theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York as the feature lecturer for this two-day consultation. This is not the first time James Cone has been a guest at Vanderbilt Divinity School and the Keller Mill Smith Institute. Dr. Cone has given the Divinity School's prestigious co-lectures, and along with black religious historian and theologian Gerard S. Wilmore, assisted the Keller Mill Smith Institute in those early days in crafting a national dialogue on what does it mean to be black and Christian, which occurred from 1992 to 1996. As part of recognizing the accomplishments of the Kevin Moses Smith Institute, we honor during this conference current and former Vanderbilt University and Divinity School faculty who contributed much to the founding, evolution, and achievements of the Keller Mill Smith Institute with legacy awards this evening. Former Hebrew Bible professor Dr. Renita Weems, professor of religious studies Dr. Lewis V. Baldwin, who was the first co-coordinator of the Keller Mill Smith Institute, 
and former professor of ethics, Dr. Peter Paris, who did the inaugural speech for the Institute so many years ago. On Thursday at the Womanist Workshop, and immediately after this session, there will be a reception where these persons will be honored with a legacy award for their contributions to the Vanderbilt Divinity School's Keller Mill Smith Institute. But right now, would you join me in giving them a hand? We anxiously await the presentation of Dr. Cohn, who now for over 45 years almost, or near that, as a black Christian theologian, forced the theological academy to engage the religious meaning of the African American struggle for justice. When in 1969 he gave theological voice to, the black, to black theology and black power with the publication of a book by that title. This publication was followed by some 12 additional books and more than 150 scholarly articles dealing with the central question of how to reconcile the gospel message of, of liberation with the reality of black oppression. And today, Dr. Cohn has unearthed the theological and revelatory power of stories and texts of black suffering through the publication of The Cross and the Lynching Tree, which he will address in this opening plenary session. A reviewer of Professor Cohn's Cross and the Lynching Tree accurately states that it diagnoses the religious dimensions of America's sickness and the contorted Christian imagination and logic that produced and perpetuated America's societal sickness even to this day. Dr. Cohn, welcome and thank you for being here in this place again here at Vanderbilt Divinity School. Coming in, we decided that there needs to be a tweeting of what is going on here. And Valerie Bridgman has designed the tag for the tweet. <laughs> well, anyway, it is calm, divine genius. Dr. Cohn. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here at Vanderbilt Divinity School, the Kelly Miller Smith Institute, and my friends, Dr. Forrest and Dr. Stacy, and all of the other doctors out there. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to say a word about wrestling with the cross and the lynching tree. People have often asked me which one of my books is my favorite, and I really couldn't say. It was like choosing one of my children but the cross and the lynching tree with that book, I now have a favorite. I've also been asked, how long did it take you to write the cross and the lynching tree? 
The formal time was approximately 10 years of research, thinking, and writing. I wrote many drafts before it reached its present form. However, in the deepest sense, I've been writing this book all my life. I put my whole being into it, mind, body, soul, and heart, and I did not hold anything back. It was like I didn't choose to write it. The cross and the lynching tree chose me. I took my time and chose every word carefully as if the integrity of black faith and the, free and the freedom struggle that arose out of it were at stake. And I'm still writing it. And it will not be finished until I draw my last breath. I remember when I first sat down to write my first book more than 40 years ago, I didn't know that I could write it. But the fire of the civil rights movement and black power were burning deep inside me, and I had to let it out. As Jesus said in the Gospel of Thomas, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Bringing forth black theology and black power saved me from a meaningless theological career. It was a transforming experience, empowering me to write with a clarity and power that even surprised me. And since that Kairos moment, I have been reading and thinking and writing almost daily, trying to make sense out of how African Americans survived and resisted four centuries of the terror of white supremacy. The cross and the lynching tree is a special moment in my theological journey. This book engaged me like no other subject. For years, I have been wrestling with the great paradox of Jesus' crucifixion and the lynching of African Americans in my classes at Union, in lectures and sermons, at seminaries, colleges, universities, and churches, community groups, and even on TV and radio shows, and with anyone who would listen. And the more I research and wrote, the more I realized that this book had to be written with the most creative, theological imagination that I could muster, and with the best prose that I could create. The subject was too important for a half-hearted, second-rate theological effort. I often wondered whether I had the literary talent to write the kind of book that the subject deserved. I am not James Baldwin or Toni Morrison, and I only have so much writing talent. And as I was writing, I prayed to God of the universe to give me the wisdom, insight, and especially the courage to write the truth about the black religious experience in the United States. I hope I have written a book that bears witness to black people's struggle for justice 
and to the faith that empowered and sustained them in their fight against great odds. Without qualification, I can honestly say I did my best. To do less would have been a theological sin. The question I have been wrestling with is this. How did African Americans survive and resist the lynching terror and keep enough of their sanity to love and to marry each other, to raise their children, and to teach them to love and to respect each other? And the answer was clear. It was their faith in God and in themselves that kept them emotionally and spiritually healthy enough to love not only themselves and each other, but even the whites who lynched them. What an amazing ethical and religious accomplishment. Whites use Christianity to lynch blacks, and blacks use it to survive and to resist whites. The more I reflected on the cross and the lynching tree, the more I understood why black Christians could not turn away from the cross, even though whites used it to enslave and to segregate and to lynch them. As James Baldwin said, white people discovered the cross by way of the Bible, but black people discovered the Bible by way of the cross. This is the great paradox in black life. Now there are theologians who will have nothing to do with the cross as an explanation of what Jesus' salvation means. Intellectually, they may be right, but I do not think so. My reasons for embracing the cross are found in my book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, to which I now turn, beginning first with three quotations. One from Acts 10.39, the second one, an eyewitness account of a 1915 lynching. And the third is a reading of a paragraph from the introduction of the cross and the lynching tree. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Acts 10.39. Hundreds of Kodaks clicked all morning at the scene of the lynching. People in automobiles and carriages came from miles around to view the corpse dangling from the end of a rope. Picture card photographers installed a portable printing plant at the bridge and reap the harvest in selling the postcards showing the photograph of a lynched Negro. Women and children were there by the score. At a number of schools, the day's routine was delayed until boy and girl pupils could get back from viewing the lynched black man. A media account of the lynching of Thomas Brooks in Fayette County, Tennessee, 1915. The cross and the lynching tree are separated by nearly 2,000 years. One is the universal symbol of the Christian faith. The other is the quintessential symbol of black oppression in America. Though both are symbols of death, one represents a message of hope and salvation. 
while the other signifies the negation of that message by white supremacy. Despite the obvious similarities between Jesus' death on the cross and the death of thousands of black men and women strung up to die on a lamppost or a tree, relatively few people, apart from black poets, novelists, and other reality seeing artists, relatively few people besides them have explored symbolic connection between the cross and the lynching tree. Yet I believe this is the challenge we must face. What is at stake is the credibility and the promise of the Christian gospel and the hope that we may heal the wounds of racial violence that continue to divide our churches and our society. Now, I have spent a lifetime pointing out the hypocrisy and the mendacity of the white church in a white-dominated society while lifting up and exalting the voices and the experiences of the oppressed. I write out of my experience as an African American growing up in segregated Arkansas and a close association with the civil rights and black power movements in the 1960s defined by Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. But more importantly, I write out of a deep theological conviction that the true power of the Christian gospel is its unambiguous call for the liberation from the forces of oppression and the fierce and uncompromising condemnation of all those who oppress. I write on behalf of all those who Latin American liberation theologians call the crucified people of history. I write for the forgotten and the abused, the marginalized and the despised. I write for those who are penniless, jobless, landless, and who have no social or political power. I write for gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgender people. I write for the undocumented farm workers toiling in misery in our nation's agriculture fields. I write for Muslims who live under the terror of war and empire in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And I write for all people who care about humanity. I believe that until we Americans, and especially theologians and Christians, can see the cross and the lynching tree together, until we can identify Christ with the re-crucified black body hanging from a lynching tree, there can be no genuine understanding of Christian identity in America and no deliverance from the brutal legacy of slavery and white supremacy. As I started reading about lynching and about the historical situation of the crosses in Rome during Jesus' time, my question was, how did African Americans survive and resist the lynching terror? How did they do it? There were nearly 5,000 African-American men, women, and children who were lynched 
in America following the Civil War and their devastated families were left behind to cope with the great loss, to live every day under the terror of death was no easy matter. I grew up in Arkansas, a lynching state. I know from experience something about lynching. I watched my mother and father deal with it. But the moment I read about it, examining lynching historically, I had to ask how in the world did blacks survive? How did they keep their sanity in the midst of all that terror? I discovered as strange and as paradoxically as it may appear, it was the cross. It was their faith in Jesus' cross, believing that if God was with Jesus, God must be with us because we are up on the cross too. My other question was, how could white Christians who say they believe that Jesus died on the cross to save them, how could they then turn around and put blocks on crosses and crucify them just like the Romans crucified Jesus? That was an amazing paradox to me. African Americans use faith to survive and resist, while whites use faith in order to terrorize black people. Two communities, both Christian, embracing the same faith. Whites even did lynchings on church grounds. How could they do it? That's where my passion came from. As I wrote this text, that's where the paradox came from. That's where my theological wrestling came from. Now many Christians embrace the conviction that Jesus died on the cross to redeem humankind from sin. Taking our place, they say. Jesus suffered on the cross and gave his life as a ransom for many. The cross is the great symbol of the Christian narrative of salvation. But unfortunately, during the course of 2,000 years of Christian history, the cross as a symbol of salvation has been detached from the ongoing suffering and oppression of human beings, the crucified people of history. The cross has been transformed into a harmless, non-offensive ornament that Christians hang around their necks rather than reminding us of the cost of discipleship it has become a form of cheap grace an easy way to salvation as Bonhoeffer put it that doesn't force us to confront the power of Christ and his message and mission in my chapter on Reinhold Niebuhr, America's most important Christian social ethicist in the 20th century, and a theologian I teach. I expose in my book Niebuhr's blindness to and tacit complicity in white oppression. Slavery, segregation, and the terror of lynching have little or no 
place in the theological reflections of Niebuhr or any other white theologian. Niebuhr had little empathy for the lesser races subjugated by white colonialists. He claimed that North America was a virgin continent when the Anglo-Saxons came with only a few Indians in a primitive state of culture. Niebuhr saw America as being elected by God to expand empire, and he wrote about the Arabs of Palestine and the people of color in the third world in a similar manner, often more justification for colonialism. I write about a radio dialogue between Niebuhr and James Baldwin following the September 1963 bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham that killed four little girls. Niebuhr spoke in that dialogue in a language of moderation that infuriated Baldwin and was disarmed by Baldwin's eloquence and fire. Baldwin said to Niebuhr, the only people in this country at this moment who believe either in Christianity or in the country are the most despised minority in it. It is ironical. The people who were slaves here the most beaten and despised people here should be at this moment the only hope that the country has. It doesn't have any other, said Baldwin. None of the descendants of Europe seem to be able to do or have taken it upon themselves to do what Negroes are trying to do. And this is not, he said, Baldwin said, a chauvinistic or racial outlook. It probably has something to do with the nature of life itself. It forces you in any extremity, any extreme, to discover what you really live by. Whereas most Americans have for so long been so safe and so sleepy that they don't any longer have any real sense what they live by. I think they really think it may be Coca-Cola. <laughs> Unquote. If white theologians like Reinhold Niebuhr, could ignore lynching and white supremacy, there must be something defective in their understanding of the faith itself. If it were not defective, then white Christians wouldn't put black people on crosses. Niebuhr and other religious thinkers wouldn't have been a silent about it. I look around and I see the same thing happening today in the prison industrial complex which Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow. You can lynch your people by more than just hanging them on a tree. You can incarcerate them. How long will this terror last? In writing this book, I found my inspiration in the black church 
along with writers like James Ball and Albert Camus, Ida B. Wells, and Richard Wright, as well as the great blues artists of my youth. These artists and writers, not the white theologians, gave me a sense of awe in the presence of humanity, fighting for justice against great odds. I saw that for most ordinary blacks, it was the blues and religion that offered them the chief weapons of resistance. It was their religion and the blues that offered sources of hope that there was more to life than what one encountered in a white man's world. In the words of the great poets and writers, in great blues singers, and in the thunderous voices of the black church, I discovered those who were able to confront the bleak circumstances of their lives and yet defy fate and suffering and make the most of what little life had to offer them. Through these connections, I found my voice which burst forth first in black theology and black power. I understood that when people do not want to be themselves, but want to be somebody else, that is utter despair, a sickness unto death, as Kierkegaard said. And I knew <coughs> that faith informed by the blues was the one thing that white people could not control or take away from African Americans. As the great bluesman Robert Johnson put it, I got to keep moving. I got to keep moving, blues falling like hell. And the day keeps on worrying me. There is a hellhound on my trail. Now, after reading Baldwin, Camus, and Wright, I wanted to go back to graduate school and study literature and get another PhD at the University of Chicago in the 1960s under the tutelage of the Negro professor Nathan Scott, Jr., widely regarded at the time as the creator and the leading scholar in the field of theology and literature. Although Nathan Scott and I talked about it, the black freedom movement in the 1960s was too urgent for me to return to school. America's cities were burning, and black people were being shot down in the streets. I said to myself, you already have a PhD. If you ain't got nothing to say now, you ain't never going to have anything to say. Forget school. Sit your ass down in that chair and write what you think. Now, although I wrote a doctoral thesis on the great Swiss theologian Karl Barth, I never taught a course on him because I like people who talk and write about the real concrete world where people are suffering daily. And unless I can feel it in my gut, I can't say it. The poor help me to say it because
because I feel their pain. The literary and activist people help me to say it because they write about suffering with imagination and power. James Baldwin is my favorite. Martin King is next. Malcolm X is the third person in my intellectual trinity. The poets and the artists give me energy. Academic theologians talk about things far removed, way out there, in some intellectual stratosphere, which only they inhabit. They talk to each other. They give each other degrees and recommend each other for teaching positions in seminaries, colleges, and universities. The real world is not where they live and think. So that is why I turn to the poets and the artists. They talk about people I know and love, the marginalized people of the world. Being a Christian is somewhat like being black. It's a paradox, a profound contradiction. You grow up black, and you can't help but wonder why whites treat you like that. It's hard to figure out especially as an innocent child. And yet, at the same time my mother told me when I was a child, don't you hate like they hate. If you do, you will self-destruct, she said. Hate kills the hater, not necessarily the hated. It was my parents' faith that gave them the inner resources to transcend white brutality and to see the real beauty in the tragedy of their lives. It is a mystery, a profound and deep mystery how African Americans, after two and a half centuries of slavery, another century of lynching and Jim Crow segregation, yet still come out loving white people. Now that's a profound ethical achievement. <laughs> now many whites, when they hear me talk and read my books, they don't think I love them, but I do. They always have a strange expression on their faces. When I say that, and look at me as if I'm kidding them. But you see, the deeper the love, the more the passion. Because when the ones you love hurt you, you are their brothers and sisters, and yet they treat you like you're not even a person. The paradox is this. In spite of slavery, lynching, and segregation, African Americans have never organized to take down this nation. We have fought and died for America in every world, even when we were not wanted. We have sacrificed our lives for a nation that despised and humiliated us. Yet, no matter what they do to us, we still come out whole, still searching for that transcendent meaning that vice cannot take away. I think the resources for survival and resistance are found in black culture 
and religion. Our faith and culture, the blues and the spiritual, gave African Americans a sense that we are not what the world says we are. The cross is a paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system with the good news that hope comes by way of defeat. That suffering and death do not have the last word. That the last shall be first. This idea is absurd to the intellect. Yet, it is profoundly real to the spiritual lives of the poor people. For many of those who were lynched and crucified, the crucified Christ manifests God's loving and liberating presence in the contradictions of black life. The cross of Jesus is that transcendent presence in the lives of black Christians which, imply, which empowers them to believe that ultimately in God's eschatological future they will not be defeated by the troubles of this world no matter how great and how painful their suffering. This paradox, this absurd claim of faith was only possible when one was stripped of power, when one was unable to be proud and mighty, when one understood that people were not called by God to rule over others. The cross was God's critique of power with powerless love, snatching victory out of defeat. Now what I'm talking about is not love. It is something that you cannot prove empirically or articulate adequately, but it is a truth self-evident in living it. I have seen the transforming power of faith in the cross among many black Christians who struggle, especially the freedom fighters during the civil rights movement. Many knew that they could die they knew that they were not going to win in the American way of winning, but they had to do what they did because of the transcendent reality encountered in their fight for justice, which was more powerful than the opposition against them. Now, people respond to that which empowers them on the inside, that which makes them know that they are somebody when the world treats them as nobody. When you can act with that spirit, then you know that there is a reality much bigger than you. One realizes that the power in me is greater than the darkness. And that's why black religion is so powerful among the people. It bears witness to spiritual resources, a light in the darkness, that empowers marginalized people to do things that seem impossible. I grew up with that. Now how do people know that they are not what the world says? 
when they have so few social and political resources to defend their humanity. So few economic resources to even physically survive. And so few educational resources to express their humanity. For many blacks in the U.S., it was their faith which was inseparable from their culture. That was why I called the blues secular spirituals. The blues are spiritual resources, a cultural power that enables black people to express their humanity. James Baldwin only finished high school. Richard Wright only the ninth grade. But they still had their saint and bore witness to a transcendence in blackness that no one could destroy. Blackness is the image of God in black people. It is the light in the white darkness. B.B. King never got out of grade school. And Louis Armstrong hardly went to any school at all. Now I said to myself, if Louis Armstrong could blow a trumpet like that, I said, forget it. I'm going to write theology the way Louis Armstrong blows that trumpet. And the way Billie Holiday sings strange fruit. I want to reach deep down in my black being for those cultural resources that enable African Americans to express themselves when the world said they had nothing to say. Now I remember, I want to close by saying my mother and father did not have my opportunity. So when I write and speak, I write and speak for them. They never had a chance to stand before white people, as I do, and tell them what they think. <laughs> I have to do that for them somehow. So I try to do that all over the world. of Lucy and Charlie Cone and all those other Lucy's and Charlie Cones who are out there but cannot speak. I think of them and not so much of myself. I think of them and I feel their spirit flowing through my body encouraging me, boy, speak the truth. They deepen my spirituality and give me something to hold on to, something that I can feel in the depth of my being, giving me courage to speak the truth. It is a very spiritual experience because you are doing something for people you love who cannot and will never have a chance to speak in a context like this at Vanderbilt University. So if you feel passion, I need to speak for people who cannot speak. For people, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, who have been left out of the sunlight of opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you
If y'all hear passion in my voice, if you feel energy in the tax crossing the lynching tree, that is because I'm thinking of Lucy and Charlie, my mother and father, trying to do justice to their courage and their faith and all the things that they taught me. And if I can do that, I think I'll stay on the right track. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my long, long-term brother and friend. My mother and father was named Sally Mae and W.T. And their stories, their texts, appeared again here tonight as Dr. Cohn uncovered for us once again the power of black life, faith in God. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Let's give him another hand. Our time frame tonight for a few questions, but tomorrow in much more time sections, in workshops, for Dr. Cohn with a panel on tomorrow at the Bishop Joe Johnson Cultural Center will engage us in discussion about these elements of black faith and religion that are so alive, they are the coal on the fire that purge us and keep us clear about who we are. 10 o'clock, the Bishop Joe Johnson Cultural Center. But for the passion of what we feel in this room and the gift that he has given into our spirits tonight, there may be one or two questions that we can entertain that carry, will carry over into tomorrow. So will you come and I have a mic here, I bring the mic to you and then Dr. Cohn will briefly respond. Yes, right here front. You mentioned that you wrote your uh, doctoral dissertation on Karl Barth, and then you never taught any course on Karl Barth. Uh, why, in the first place, you pick Karl Barth and spend like two years, one years of your life to? Uh... Well, that's a good question. I wanted a PhD. <laughs> And I want it, you know, if I'm going to write on a European, I want the most important, most dominant one there was. So I wanted the one on top. So I would really have something to wrestle with. And uh, it really was a very, uh, you know, it, it, it served me well because I really learned what theology was about from European's point of view, from white American's point of view. You got to know the enemy now. <laughs> you do. You have to know. <laughs> United States trying to know North Korea right now. <laughs> That's what's puzzling them. So you got to know, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted, when I speak, I wanted, I wanted to be heard. That's why I went to Union Seminary. I had four or five other institutions, actually, 
I went to Union. I was an assistant professor and no tenure, even though I had six years of teaching experience before then and had published two books. And I could have gone to Colgate, University of California, Santa Barbara, San Francisco Theological, several other places offered me tenure and associate professorship. I went to you because I, that was at that time, at the peak. And I said, if I can make black liberation theology, make it make sense here, where Dan Williams, Roger Shin, John McQuarrie, and the whole slew of them were there. I walked in there. <laughs> You know, you know, and that's, that's why I wrote on Bart for that reason. I went to Union that reason. This is my 44th year at Union. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they don't, you know, you know. The Lord has been good to me. They got canes. I'm, I'm still walking. See, I don't know how long I'm going to walk. I don't know. But I just take one day at a time. That, that, that's preaching now. That's, 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 that's homiletic. That's, that's preaching. Come on now. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you talked about the paradox of the cross, that hope for our four parents came by way of defeat. What's missing today? Fast forward today that today it seems as if for this generation, just hopelessness comes from defeat. How do we in the black church today, serving this present age, resurrect that paradox, that hope comes out of defeat. That, it's, it's that question that made me write the book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. I think the black church had forgotten about where it came from. I really do. AME is getting ready to celebrate that 200 years. 2016. They don't know who they are. No, they don't. That's why they don't like me. Because I'll tell them. I tell them just like I tell white folks. <laughs> and they don't like it. Because they don't know. They, you, you know, to be, to stay on target, you got to have a critical voice. You got to have a prophetic voice in your church. And when you don't have that, you die. And theology is that prophetic voice which the church raises up to critique itself. And when you lose that critique, you lose your way. And most black churches have lost their way. I'm an AME, so I like to talk about my family. That's why they won't let me speak in any of their old conferences, because they know I will tell them, and no bishop is going to silence me, because they don't pay my salary. And the people that do pay my salary, I've got tenure. Uh -huh. yeah, they, even the old union can't do nothing. See? You don't get tenure in the AME church. No. But I said to myself, when I was growing up, I, I said, I'm going to get to the point where nobody is going to silence me. No. They 
they put Jesus on the cross because they wanted to silence him. So the black church dies because it has lost its own prophetic, prophetic critique. It is too busy saving itself. It has forgot that he that saves his life shall lose it. Yeah. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. And I'm going to say it as long as the Lord gives me breath. One, one, one more question. Now there was a, a way in the back. Dr. Odie, let me run back here and that's be the last one. Let me give you the mic. A statement of thanks to Forrest Harris for having vision and being uh, pro prophetic in what he does here at Vanderbilt in Nashville and bringing you here and thanking you for what you have said and will say. Thank you both. Thank you. I thought he had a question. That was, I thought he had a question. Because there is, okay, I'm, I'm being pushed and torn. Yes. Dr. Cohn, 30 years ago, I'm class of 81 ITC and your message, I have it on cassette. What is the more? 30 years later, what is the more? What is the more? Then I come up with it. Yeah. <clears throat> that more is that, is that cross. That's the more. But we don't want it. We don't want it. See, the gospel is not our culture. It's more. It comes through it, but it's more. And that more is at the cross. And that's the paradox. The gospel is a paradox. It makes no rational sense. None. And that's why we walk away from it. Because it, 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 it. See, Jesus in Matthew, Jesus said, I, 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 you know, I come not to the wise, but to the babes, to the, to the little people. That's grace. The grace is the more, the cross. That's the more. And when you see that more, you always see humility. And you always see a power that is greater than yourself. And that's, you know, the Lord has blessed me. I come from Beard and Arkansas. There are nine people in my graduating class from high school. Now, I hardly knew how to write my name. But without the AME Church, going to Charlotte College in North Little Rock, Arkansas, then Philando Smith College in Little Rock, going to Garrett, almost flunked out. Yes, I did. Yeah. But the Lord you know, pushing me on. I was not the brightest. I was not the smartest. I just said, I'm going to keep doing the best I can every day. And I try to study and write and read at least eight hours a day. And I've been doing that for about 40 some years. 
See, you can be average. You can be average if you work like that. You might write something. See? You write, you know, you don't have to be a genius. You just have to be focused and get hold of it and never, never, never let it go. Never let it go. And I look back over my life, I don't know how I got here. It's purely the grace of God. If you don't know what the grace of God is, look at my life. Because yeah. I didn't earn it. And I, I ain't no brilliant person. I just try to speak what I know is the truth. You know Jesus, didn't you have a PhD? <laughs> No, he was in that peasant. He didn't go to school. And if he had insight, if God was in him, maybe a little God is in me. God can take nothing and make something out of it. Here it is, right here. Here it is. Take nothing and make something. And I thank God. Just keep me humble. Keep me focused. And keep me serving others. Thank you. That's 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 the Yeah. Thank you. 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 The black church is present. Black Christianity is present. Because here I am, if it wasn't for the grace of God, Lewis Ball and myself, many others, Peter Paris, would not be here. Yeah. It's hard to let this moment go. It's really hard. But we must. There's a schedule. There's a reception where we're going to honor some people. And the reception is immediately behind me as you go out these doors either way to my right and you walk down the hall and you'll see the area where the reception is going to be. Uh, again, tomorrow at 10 at the Bishop Joe Johnson Cultural Center, Dr. Cohn will rehash or bring to synthesis more what he said tonight than the panel will be uh, interacting with him uh, in relationship to the cross and the lynching tree and how it now challenges the black church to embrace its own story, its own text, but that's where its salvation is. Thank you. Let us now proceed to the reception on either side. Thank you. <laughs>